today we talk about innovation and tradition, but I am more innovation than tradition. Especially in a country like the Philippines, where we don't really know who we are because we are just in the process of defining ourselves. 300 years in the convent, as people say, and 50 years in Hollywood, we are the most confused people in the planet. And, uh, and now we're seeing that uh, together with other emerging countries of the world, we're starting to define ourselves. And uh, I find it uh, most interesting at this point in my life that I work more with young people than those who are my age. Uh, I guess my journey began when I was 35 years old when I had my midlife crisis. Uh, just like uh, many of the people in this country, you know, we were taught to study hard, to become successful, get rich, and give to charity. And I realized that I did all that, but at 35, uh, I discovered that uh, you can uh, achieve your ambition, but doesn't necessarily make you a happy person. And uh, oftentimes, when we are just ambition-driven, we get uh, something that we realize later on is an empty bag. And uh, so at 35, I had a wife, I had three children, but I was not happy uh, because uh, I realized that uh, the more that I was driven by uh, a desire for personal success, I was living in a country where there was deepening poverty and there was growing corruption. And I also re uh, realized that uh, the tradition drives us, development is driven by, by charity, when uh, we need to realize that as a Christian country, we have to also talk about Christian stewardship. And, and so uh, three things that was very clear to me uh, that uh, I needed to address. One was that we had become a mendicant society. We, uh, we were migratory and we were also mercenary. And uh, I often wondered, people talk about sustainable development, but what I saw was sustainable poverty. And, uh, and I tried to understand my, our situation, the five S's of sustainable poverty that the Filipino was living as a squatter. And a squatter does not have any dignity, does not have any security, and a country of squatters cannot be globally competitive. Uh, so the second thing was that the Filipino had lowered his standards in his subhuman conditions. He was living in a shanty, that's the second S. And uh, so he could not come up with the, the best quality products because he himself is born and raised in a shanty, in a, in a pile of garbage. And the third, he is raised in a village called a slum. It takes a village to raise a child, so he's surrounded by drug addicts and drunks. And so there are no village models. He has lost, we have lost the fathers in our home and the heroes in our communities. And the fourth is that uh, he's in a survival mode. Yeah. And uh, so the, the environment is quite predatory and mercenary. And fifth is that it's a subsistence economy. We call it isang kahig, isang tuka. One scratch, one peck. And uh, so we realize that a country that does not deserve to be poor is poor. A country that also has a tradition of very strong Christian values is one of the most corrupt. And so this was the source of my midlife crisis. And uh, I realized too that I just followed the old patterns. You now send your children to the most exclusive schools, become successful, live in a, an exclusive subdivision, and just create your own artificial bubble of security and comfort in a sea of third world poverty. And I realized that that's not the kind of legacy I wanted to pass on to my children. They cannot wander, in the, they cannot walk the streets uh, in safety. And especially the most successful, they are also the most vulnerable you know, uh, to, criminal, to, 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 to crime and to, to rebellion. At the same time, in the countryside, the poor continue to be the most vulnerable to the calamities, to the typhoons, and to the floods. So I, I realized too that at 35, I, I was at the prime of my life. I had so much energy. Why was I so unhappy? And that's when I went to the biggest slum in the country called Bagong Silang, north of Manila, and started to really discover, because I was in search of my soul as a Filipino, as a Christian, and as a human being. 
and I did not find it in the artificial surroundings that I just uh, boxed myself in. I, be, I lived in an exclusive subdivision with security guards with high walls, and I was surrounded by squatters around me, my people, my family that I did not know. And so I realized that I had to go beyond my own definition of family. I had to consider the poor, the orphans, the criminals, the rebels as my family. Otherwise, I will not invest my time, my talent, my treasure. I'll just, it's just convenient to write out a check and just perpetuate this whole uh, uh, tradition of charity. So anyway, I realized that it is really about connectivity, that the brightest and the best, those with the greatest opportunities are disconnected from our people, are disconnected from the land, are disconnected from our rich natural resources, and, and that's the reason why we're poor. Now, there are countries that do not have the fertile land that we have, do not have the biodiversity, the rich natural resources, do not even have our, our producer, our, our human resource and, uh, and our market base, almost 100 million market base. And, uh, you know, it's, it was now very interesting for me just coming home from Davos, where I was, uh, uh, I was invited two weeks ago. And uh, yesterday, it was very fascinating that Finally, what I, my own reflections about Davos was printed at the Huffington uh, Post, and uh, it was simply just my own personal view of a ground-up development, where we have to start to see the world through the eyes of the poor and the suffering, because it has always been top-down development. It's always been the rich, the powerful, the best educated, those who controlled wealth and money, who made all the decisions in our country that just... Uh, that were, who were disconnected from the suffering of the majority. And I, I had to start with my own reconnection, because if there's something wrong in any country, it's, it's not the fault of others, it's my fault. So I worked with the criminals and young members uh, for uh, three years in Bagong Silang. I introduced uh, programs for sports, education, scholarship, but I discovered unless it is really holistic, unless you transform the physical environment, unless you restore human dignity, you address social justice, that it will be very difficult to sustain. And after burying six of the gang leaders that we had rehabilitated, five of them were killed by their former enemies, by drink, drinking bodies, because transformation does not happen overnight. And one of them committed suicide when our training center for livelihood was closed, and that was his only hope. So this, this whole journey, had its own pain, and it was painful because when you start to consider the poor as family, and I also realized that my children have no future in this country or anywhere in the world if my country remains third world and my people remain second class. So the whole objective for me of development was to restore the dignity, my honor as a Filipino. And as long as majority of my people live as squatters in slums, I will continue to live with this honor, and I will pass on that legacy to my children. So the first village we built, it was through volunteerism. It was through, it was not anchored on fundraising. Because I realized that uh, if we just go for the money, that, uh, that, that it cannot be sustained. It cannot be sustained by charity. It cannot just, it had to be uh, a passion for a transcendent cause. And uh, very early, it was not just a project to ease human suffering. It was for me. Uh, a journey towards ending poverty in our country. And it was about uh, restoring human dignity, giving land to the landless, giving homes to the homeless, and uh, water for, for, for people who had no clean water. And uh, it's simply amazing because uh, we have discovered that uh, we don't need to, to wait for foreign aid or to foreign charity, that we have the we have the brains, we have the heart, we have the resources to end poverty. If we just rise above our, our politics, we rise above our rivalries, we rise above our parochialism, and really have a shared vision to end poverty in our country. And for us to be able to really uh, uh, have that as the highest, as the driving passion for us. So even the top universities, you know, should make it priority. It's not just to fuel personal ambition for career, but really for their own graduates to have a vision for their country, for them to have pride in being Filipino. 
And, and I, re I realized that foundational to all my, to this is, uh, is for me to really show the world that God did not make a mistake when he made me Filipino. That there is so much wealth in this country. That there is so much opportunity that we can offer our people. So the task for me was to show that uh, in this country, we should not just graduate job seekers here or abroad. We should graduate wealth creators and job generators. And that we should see that the greatest wealth of, of this country is our people, including the poorest of the poor, including the rebels and the criminals. And, and uh, we should not look for opportunities in other parts of the world because we realize that people from other countries will have their own share of trouble. When I was in Davos, the, the Europeans were talking about Euro debt woes and the Americans were, were, were just battling it out with their own recession blues. And now people are starting to realize that uh, more and more solutions to the world problems in the West and in the North are in the emerging countries of the South and the East. And, and so somehow because of my background as uh, an economist and also working for, for a multinational company in marketing, I realized that what the Filipino need was positive branding. And uh, so we had Gawad Kalinga that embodied the best of the Filipino in his own country. And uh, we, we, we wanted this to be the product of his love for his country, for his people, and we called it Padugo, bleeding for the cause. Anyway, the first village we created in Bagong Silang has inspired many people to discover that they can do it. And many of our people abroad started to build their own village in the poorest towns or barangays where they came from. And after we launched this in 2003 uh, with, uh, with various schools, uh, a lot of young people who became our volunteers, we have been able to build 2,000 communities and impacted on the lives of about a million people. And uh, what is interesting is that our latest count is we've had already more than a million volunteers in, in our communities. So it has become the work of nation building. And lately, we are very happy that our legislators have also taken notice and are now have filed a bill called the uh, uh, House Bill 4374. It's the House Bill for Volunteerism for Nation Building. And the goal is to build 50,000 communities, one per barangay, following the Gawad Kalinga model. So that's addressing the issue of social justice for 5 million families in our country because that will now become the, the, the platform for good citizenship, for productivity, and for bottom of the pyramid wealth creation. And so after building the first uh, village, we are now, we're now embarking on the second phase. We call it the phase of social artistry. We're now building the Enchanted Farm Village University in Angat Bulacan. This is the first of 25 uh, farm village universities. Farm, because it uh, it's really encourages people in the city to go to, 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 to find opportunities in the countryside. It is about the management and the and the uh, business graduates of the top schools in the city to work with scientists and to work with uh, agriculturists and to work with the, for the rich, to work with the poor, for us to really transform this country into a land of, uh, of, of squatters, into a land of, uh, of, of uh, rebels in the countryside, and to be able to see that we have over 12 million hectares of underproductive land where we can plant coffee and, 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 and cacao, because uh, what it, to me is really disturbing is a country that, uh, that can feed the cattle and the carabaos and produce milk because we have cacahuate, we have grass, we have malungay, and uh, we, have, uh, we have, you know, napier, everything is here, but we import 99% of our milk. And we can, we can produce the best chocolate, we can produce, you know, the best ice cream using local ingredients and so on. So, now, the second phase is to really look at the different industries that are undeveloped, like our chocolate. We only, we consume 36,000 tons of, 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 of chocolate beans, but we produce only 6,000. So why should we import? And uh, to me, it's very tragic that the producers of cacao and coffee are from the equator belt and down, but the rich countries own the brand and own the, all the wealth. And so it's very, uh, it's important for us to really just you know, uh, go back and uh, reconnect with the uh, resources that we have. And so uh, uh, we hope that we can, we're moving to the phase of sustainability through innovation. Before Gawad Kalinga, it was not the practice in this country for landowners to donate their land to the poor. 
But when we showed that if you have 10 hectares of land and you give two hectares of it, we can bring 100 families out of being informal settlers, out of living in the slums, and build uh, communities where, where people have strong values, that people can build their homes and can now really uh, have the motivation to work or send their children to school, we realized that we trigger uh, economic development, we bring peace and order, land values start to go up, and so landowners now, we, now we have land coming out of our ears. So in, in seven years, we were able to raise enough land in 400 towns, good for a million families. So I don't think it's a problem for us to get land for five million, to get five million families out of being informal settlers in this country. You know, it is about solidarity. It's about, about uh, 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 a passion for, for the next generation that uh, learning from our own mistake, that is selfishness, it's greed, it's self-interest that has made this country poor and corrupt. And uh, so uh, we hope that uh, we can get more of the students in Savior to really invest in countryside development. We're coming up with our social innovation uh, camps this summer. We're building a 100-bed facility now in Angat. And uh, we'll be inviting the business and the management students and even the, the third year and fourth year high school uh, to come up in our uh, career uh, camps and also for us to really train them in social uh, in social uh, entrepreneurship, in green innovation, and so on. So uh, we have, this is, uh, this is uh, the, uh, to me, the most interesting uh, place in the world to live in. Uh, it's, to me, the most exciting time to be Filipino. And, and, uh, and it's not even about legal citizenship. It's not even the color of our skin. Right now, I have with me our volunteers from France. This, this year, we're expecting over a 1,000 people from Europe who will do their internship with us in our Gawad Kalinga communities because they're starting to see that uh, this is now the Asian age and this is also the time for global partnership that uh, those who have developed technology in the West will be able to really work with the creative uh, talents of our, of, our, of our country to really transform this country and, and make it productive and expand the market base. A lot of big business now are supporting us because they realize that investing in bringing people out of poverty makes good business sense because it expands the market base. And it also brings peace, and uh, which is very important in terms of uh, sustainability. So uh, this is just an old man rattling. You know, I am very, uh, I'm always very impatient for young people to wake up and, and for them to now be connected uh, because many of our young people are have very, they have, their hearts, they are very idealistic. They're very, uh, their, their hearts are less corrupted and their minds are less polluted, but they're just disconnected. They're connected through social networking. They're all Facebook users, Twitter users. They go to the clubs, etc. but they do not know the poor. So the first thing to, that, 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 that this, the brightest and the best of people here and abroad, just like what the friends are doing, is for them to know the poor, because that is the abandoned wealth of the world. For them also to go to the rural areas, because it's not just in the in the malls that you find opportunities, or in in the big in the in the in the in the uh, developed areas, because uh, you know areas that have hit rock bottom have no place to go but up. That's where the opportunities are. And so again, we hope that uh, you can continue to help us as we transform the countryside. First, we're addressing the uh, the needs of the disaster victims. Right now, we are building 5,000 homes. For the Sendong victims in Mindanao, we have a team right now to help also the earthquake victims in, in, in uh, Dumaguete. And the amazing thing is just build and they will come. If, they, if you build it right and if you show the world, the, the, the people also who are part of this, because it cannot be done by one man or one organization, my role is to just create the platform. My role is just connect people. My role is to just for us to really be on the same page in terms of the kind of world we want to build. And so uh, this is an exciting time. My only problem is that I have enjoyed working with young people, not only with the poor, but also with young people. Because in Davos, I saw that the owners of technology are mostly young. And <laughs> so the, 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 the young people own the future. And so, and these are exciting times. I realized that that's also, you know, what innovation is about. Always have aspirations, always have hope. So that because aspiration drives innovation, invention, and creation. Thank you.